Well, good morning, Heritage Church. I knew that this was going to be a great morning uh, for a handful of reasons. When I got here this morning, I was watching the Broncos game uh, on my phone because they were playing over in London, and the day started with a miracle. The Broncos won a football game. <laughs> they won a football game, and I said, well, this is going to be a great day. And then I was walking from kids over here, and Wilder Meeks comes up, and he puts a packet of peanut M&Ms on my arm, which is my favorite candy. And I said, this day just cannot get better. And then I walked in here and saw half the room dressed alike. And I said, you know what? This day can get better. <laughs> and so I don't want to steal the wife's glory. I actually want to invite all of you who had loving, caring wives to come up here so that we can all embrace this together. So anybody that is wearing your plaid shirt, please come up front. We're just going to get a picture. We're going to drink this in for a moment <laughs> that we can appreciate how good this is, how kind and loving our wives are. Wives, drink this moment in. Get your picture. Post to social. Make this a thing because you know what? It worked out so well. So much joy. So since we're all together, oh, so good. So much camaraderie. Well, I had to give the wives their moment. Props on that. I, uh, I was telling some people that that happened to my old small group on Father's Day, and I had told Britt, I'm like, if you ever dress me, I kind of know that's coming. So this morning when I got done with my run, she's like, I laid out an outfit for you. I'm like, of course you did. <laughs> that's normal. I'm 37 years old. But... Either way, I can appreciate the uh, I can appreciate the gag. Well done, ladies. Uh, so I have a picture up here, and I don't know if any of you know who this is, but this guy's name is Bob Goff, and he is incredible. If you were to ask Bob what he does, he would tell you that he is a fundraiser. And if you probed a little bit deeper and asked him, well, what is it you fundraise for, Bob? You need to prepare to have your mind blown because. Apart from being an attorney, which he was for 25 years, he's also a New York Times bestselling author uh, of multiple books, not about being an attorney because not that many people would want to read that, but they're about loving people. See, Bob is this person that just radiates love, and so his first book was Love Does, and he ended up naming uh, his charity after that, and then his second book was Everybody Always, and I'm going to talk a lot about these books today, but what love does... Uh, actually does is they try to minister to kids in war-torn areas. So these are areas that are either embroiled in conflict currently or past uh, places that are basically picking up the pieces after war. And so they have things going in Uganda, Iraq, Nepal, Somalia, Afghanistan, India, and the Dominican Republic, and that list probably goes on. But one of the things that Bob does is he speaks around the world. So he talks a lot about his books and these concepts of becoming love. And so I'm going to read uh, a couple quotes that I pieced together from his book, Everybody Always, to kind of set the stage here for this morning. He says this, Jesus talked to his friends a lot about how we should identify ourselves. He said it wouldn't be what we said we believed or all the good things we hope to do someday. Nope. He said we would identify ourselves simply by how we loved people. It's tempting to think that there's more to it but there's not. Love isn't something we fall into. Love is someone we become. He goes on to say, God's idea isn't that we would just give and receive love, but that we could actually become love. People who are becoming love see the beauty in others, even when their off-putting behavior makes for a pretty weird mask. God's endgame has always been the same. He wants our hearts to be his. He wants us to love the people near us and to love the people we've kept far away. To do this, he wants us to live without fear. We don't need to use our opinions to mask our insecurities anymore. Instead, God wants us to grow love in our hearts and then cultivate it by the acre in the world. We'll become in our lives what we do with our love. Those who are becoming love don't throw people off roofs. They lower people through them instead. Now, I could sit up here for 30 minutes and just read this book to you, and you'd probably get more out of it than the sermon. But one, that would be plagiarism. And two, I would rob you of the opportunity to read the books yourself, which I would encourage you to do. But I do want to really grab a hold of this idea of becoming love. Because last week, I talked about this idea of love. And we talked about how God is love, right? 
that love does not define God, but God defines love. And a lot of that is how do we become that? Because that's what we're called into as followers of his, that he's telling us that what I have done, you should do also, that you should go into the world and you should do as I have done, that you need to become love as well. And in chapter four of 1 John, we dug into this concept a lot over the last few weeks. And so what I wanted to do this week, one, because uh, this is where the text goes, but two, because we have the kids with us, is to tell stories of what Jesus does and how he sets this example for us. That there are times and there are places where we struggle to become love, but where Jesus has stepped into the muck and the mire and the dirty places of humanity and showed us what it looks like to become love. And so I'm going to tell four separate stories from the Gospels this morning that are going to parallel uh, Jesus' love and the things that we should mimic in that. But before I jump into those texts today, I want to pray. So would you guys pray with me? Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, being able to laugh about the silly things, about uh, our wives setting us up for funny pictures and for uh, the opportunity to have a bounce house here at church and to have our kids in here with us at church, and just how great that is, God, uh, that we get this beautiful blessing of our children being a heritage from you, that we should raise them up, that we should train them up in you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us uh, to minister well, not only to our own children, uh, but to this community. As we dedicated uh, a child last week, just thinking about how the church community is to come around uh, these families that are raising little ones and to support them and to uplift them and to pray for them, uh, God, all so that we can continue to build your kingdom through these kids. And so, Lord, as we dive into the text this morning, I pray that you would open our hearts and that you would help us to hear what it is you want us to hear. Lord, help me to get out of your way. Help me to merely be a conduit for your message and to be received here this morning. Lord, again, we thank you for the opportunity to dive into your word, to worship you together, to be in community, and to fellowship with one another. Lord, go with us now as we open the text. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So this morning we are going to continue in 1 John chapter 4, and last week we did verses 7 to 12, and this section from 7 to 21 is one continuous section, and so I'm going to pick up in verse 13, I'm going to read through 21, and you're going to hear how a lot of these themes that we talked about not only last week, but all throughout the book of 1 John are going to be repeated in this section. So 1 John chapter 4, picking up in verse 13, says this, By this we know that we abide in him. And he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now John starts this passage in a similar way that he's done throughout. He talks about by this we know that. And in this section he's saying that by this love that we have, which we discussed last week, we know that we abide in him and he in us, which again is another repeated theme that we've seen throughout the book of 1 John. This idea of abiding comes up over and over again. It's this idea of dwelling within. And he talks about how the Spirit dwells within us. And we know that the Spirit dwells within us because of the love that we have. If the Spirit dwells in us, this is God dwelling within us, then we will live out the type of love that God has for others. And so he's saying, by this we know that. And then he says in verse 16, this repeated theme that I talked about from last week, again, that God is love. And this is a transformational truth, and it's something that we really need to grab a hold of. So I talked last week about how we know everything that we know about love because of God. 
And the type of love, we talked about this agape type love, right? It is a love that is committed to the needs and best interests of other people regardless of the cost. So it's not a liking of things. It's not a preference for certain things. It is a self-sacrificing, unconditional love. That's how we know what love from the Lord looks like. And he's saying that Jesus embodied this, right? That love took on flesh. And uh, I was reading this book this week uh, by a guy named Dane Ortland, and he gave this example. He said, if you were to peel back the skin on a Stepford wife or on the Terminator, you would find a robot. But he said, if you peel back the skin on Jesus, you would find love. He's saying it's what he's made of. It's what he's comprised of. He cannot do anything. He cannot be anything other than love because that's who he is. And this is why I wanted to emphasize this, this idea of becoming love this morning. And I said, I think the best way to do this is to see how Jesus did this. See this in the example that he set for us, in the ways that he did it, in the ways that we might struggle to do it. And so I want to use the last three verses from this morning, from 1 John, kind of as this jumping off point. Because verse 19 gives us a new idea that we haven't seen in the book of 1 John yet. And then the last couple verses are repeated themes that we see. So verse 19 is this new idea that we love because he first loved us. Again, we didn't know how to love. It is not in our nature. We don't understand how to love the way that Jesus loves. But because he loved us that way, now we have an example. Now we know how to love other people. And then there's these two repeated themes. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now that theme is repeated uh, throughout the book of 1 John. And chapter 2 really digs into that where he's saying that you cannot do this without that. This is one of the tests of love that we see. We talked about the last uh, couple weeks. And when I thought about how Jesus teaches this to his disciples, I think his example is really poignant. And I've shared this idea about how to teach and how to disciple people before. But something that I see in the ministry of Jesus is this model of watch me, help me, I'll help you, and then I'll watch you. It's this idea that I know you don't know what you're doing, so watch me do it. Watch and learn. And then I'm going to invite you in. I'm going to invite you into this blessing, and you're going to help me do it. And you see Jesus do this with the disciples as he is beginning to send them out, as he's preparing them, as they are participating in some of the miracles. Think about the feeding of the 5,000, that he invites them in to help him. And then there's this sending out. You can see this in Luke chapter 9, where he sends them out and tells them, go and do these things. And then they come back and they report to him the things that he's done, where he is helping them. He is guiding them. And then at the sending, at the ascension, at the end, he says, now you go into all the earth and do this, right? And this is what he's wanting for us as well, that we get the example of Jesus in scripture. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from the different ways that Jesus does this. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to start with two stories here right in the beginning. Uh, the first one is going to be the verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to read uh, 5 through 12 after that. So Matthew chapter 8 starts this way. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now, leprosy is a bacterial disease that affects the nerves and the skin and the eyes and the lining of the nose. And I remember reading years and years ago this book by Philip Yancey, Where is God When It Hurts? And he talks about how he spent some time in a leper colony and he learned to understand what the disease was and what it was about and why it was so challenging for these people. And he said, we think about the sores on the skin and those things that are visible to us. But he said the most damaging thing in there is this loss of feeling in the nerves that they no longer have the ability to feel when something's happening. So something simple like sweeping a room can lead them to getting their hands all cut up because they don't understand how hard they're grasping the broom because they can no longer feel it. And then a simple cut can turn into an infection, which then spirals down and makes them more and more sick. Now, in the time of Jesus, people who had leprosy were considered unclean. 
they were forced to live outside of society with other people. If they were to come to a place where there were other people, they would have to announce their presence. They would literally have to scream out, unclean, as they walk into a space to let everybody know that they're coming so that nobody else would touch them or would interact with them that wasn't aware of what was going on. And the thought process was, if one of these people touched you, you were now unclean. And you would have to live outside of society for at least a week while they made sure that you didn't contract leprosy. And so there's a couple sides to the pain that these people are feeling. There's the physical pain of everything that they're going through, but there's the mental and emotional pain of being completely separated from society, of not being touched, of not being seen, of not being heard, of not being engaged with people. And this is where Jesus steps into the story, and I think this is what's so beautiful, is that this word for, if you will, is wish, right? It can be translated as wish. If you wish, you can make me clean. You can make me well. And Jesus immediately touches him, which is, again, culturally something that would never happen. And then he says, I wish, I will, I do want you to be clean. And the man is immediately cleansed. Now, there's a couple things that are incredible here. The first thing is that instead of this man making Jesus unclean, Jesus makes him clean. And he does it by touching him, by reaching out and showing compassion and empathy and care for somebody who has not experienced that for who knows how long. The second thing is that he was healed. Now, again, I talked about leprosy. One of the ways that this would show up for people is that it was a skin disease. So they would have these white splotches and these different things on their skin that were very visible. And so I think we lose the miraculous nature of this because we just read that and say, yeah, he was healed. He was cleaned. But imagine being in that place. Imagine seeing somebody who has leprosy, who has sores all over their skin, who may have a deformed face because their nose has begun to rot away. They may have cuts all over them. And Jesus touches them, and he's, he's healed. The skin is made perfect. This person walks away perfectly healthy. How incredible that would be. And we lose that because we just read the words, right? He was healed. Oh, that's cool. That's what a nice thing for him to do, right? But then the third thing is that Jesus tells him not to tell anyone. And this is going to lead us to the first couple things that I want us to learn here today. And the way that I'm going to talk about the points today is I'm going to talk about them in the realm of becoming love. So people who are becoming love don't sound a trumpet to let everyone know how loving they are. They just love. You'll see this in a lot of the miracles of Jesus. When Jesus heals somebody, when he does something for somebody, he tells them not to tell anybody. He's not trying to build fame. He's not trying to build a claim. He is trying to love people. He's meeting them where they're at. Second thing that we learn is that people who are becoming love are not afraid of those that the world deems unclean because they realize that they probably need love more than anyone. There are a lot of people in our society who would feel as though they are outcasts, as though they are unclean, they are unwanted, they are unloved. And it's our job as ambassadors for Jesus to step into those places and to love those people, to show them compassion and care and kindness because these are things that they are not regularly experiencing. And don't undervalue how important touch is to people. When you think about physical touch, these people who have not had physical touch, who have not had care or affection or a handshake or a hug, how meaningful that is to somebody who has not had that, that we can show love in that way. Now, immediately after this story, we pick up in verse 5. And I want to give a little bit of context for this story. So this next story is about the centurion's faith. The centurion was a Roman soldier. They were in charge of a hundred other soldiers. And... This is talking about his faith, but I want you to understand who the Romans were to the Jews at this time. They did not like each other. The Romans were the controlling authority in this place. They were over the Jews. And so when you think about rivalries, think about some of the best rivalries you can think of, right? Like Duke and Carolina. You can think of the Celtics and the Lakers back in the day. You can think like Rocky versus Drago. Like there's no love lost between these people. They don't like each other. They don't trust each other. But the Jews have to be subservient to them because of fear and because of the control in the region. And so that's the context that we're setting up here in the story. Now pick up in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 8. It says this. When he, Jesus, entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, 
I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now, I want you to pause for just a second and think about something else that isn't talked about in this story, but that we understand on the other side of history. About three years later, about 80 miles to the south, Jesus is going to be mocked. He's going to be beaten. He is going to be crucified. He is going to be pierced. By who? The Romans. But do we see any hesitation in what Jesus says here? No. He tells the centurion, I will come and heal him. But what's incredible is not just that he was healed with a word from far away or that there was no hesitation in this, but it's the centurion's faith that's talked about. This Roman soldier, this person from outside the nation of Israel, whose faith is commended, his belief in Jesus is commended for this. And at the end of the story, Jesus tells him to go and let it be done for you as you have believed. Now, there's a ton that I could unpack from this story, but I want to stick on this theme of becoming love. Those who are becoming love see people as beloved children created in the image of God not by the labels of the world. Jesus didn't see him as a centurion. He didn't see him as a Roman citizen. He didn't see the servant as someone who didn't deserve to be healed. He saw him as someone who was created in the very image of God, who was knit together in his mother's womb, which we see in Psalm 139. And he had compassion on him. When we read about Jesus and his compassion, one of the words that the scripture uses is our heart. And he's stirred up in his heart. But what it, what it means in the Greek is literally he was stirred up in his bowels. His, his inward parts were moved to compassion to love this person whom he had never seen, whom he had never met, and on behalf of somebody else. And it was because he didn't see this person as a label. Now for you, this is going to look a little different. This might mean loving somebody who is a Republican or a Democrat, loving somebody who is pro-life or someone who is pro-choice. This might mean loving a family member who drives you absolutely insane. But one thing I know for certain is that it's going to require of you to remove a label that the world or you has placed upon another person and to take that instead and put a new label on that person that they are a chosen child of the Most High God who deserves our love, who deserves our compassion because they are created in the image of God. Now I want you to flip over to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 1 where we read this next story. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now there's, a, again, a ton that I could unpack about this story, but I want to point something out here that in your Bibles, if you look at them, there's probably not a verse 4 here, which seems a little bit weird. Verse 4 was only included in some of the early manuscripts, and what verse 4 says explains a lot of the story because it says that an angel of the Lord would stir up the pool 
at Bethesda. And the first person that would step into the pool after it had been stirred up by this angel of the Lord would be healed. So that was the commonly held belief about this place. So you can understand why the blind and the lame and the sick are all there. This idea is that when it's stirred up, the first person to step in gets healed. But what I want you to pay attention to is less about what's happening there and more about what Jesus says. The question that Jesus asks this man is, do you want to be healed? It says that he's been there for 38 years. Now let's just assume for the sake of the story that this pool is stirred up once a day just because it makes the math easier. This means that there's 13,870 chances that this guy has had to get from his place into the pool in order to be healed. But when Jesus asks them, do you want to be healed? All he has is 13,870 excuses. Notice in the story that he doesn't say that he wants to be healed. His life right now is sitting in a place and letting his needs be met by others. Part of the giving structure of the Jews at this time was that they would give alms to the poor, that they would go to these places where these people who were unable to care for themselves were, and they would give them alms, they would give them money, they would provide food. So this guy has been waited on by other people. He's carved out his nice little niche in these roofed colonnades. He's got shade. He's got a place to live. And he's just sitting there and not actually doing anything. And Jesus steps in and says, do you even want to be made well? And without waiting for the answer, he heals him. And there's a couple things that we learn about this in becoming love. Becoming love means that we speak the truth to people even when it's difficult. Now, this doesn't give you free reign to just go around and say terrible things to people. This is meant as a means of encouragement, right? That Jesus saw more in this person than what he was living out. And he called him to stand. And that's the second thing here that we learn about becoming love. Becoming love means calling people to get up and walk. Now, one of the things that I mean by this is that you can look at different people in your life and you can see the potential that's latent in them. You can see the things that they are capable of doing that they're afraid to step out and do. But as Christ followers, this is one of the things that we need to encourage one another. In Hebrews 10, you see this idea of stirring one another up towards love and good deeds. That when we see brothers and sisters who are not living up to their full potential, it's calling them to get up, to grab their mat and walk. Don't sit back and rest on what Jesus has accomplished. Take that message out to the world. Use the gift, use the things that he has given you to go and do that. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about this difference between orthopraxy and orthodoxy. That orthodoxy is this idea of right belief, that we believe the right things, that we know scripture, we know what's to be true from scripture. But orthopraxy is taking that knowledge and letting that transform you and begin to move your hands and feet into action, to do the things that that good knowledge encourages you to do that we can have all of the right answers. We can say all of the right Sunday school answers when called upon, but if that does not move us into compassion and into love, we're not actually understanding it. That truth has not begun to transform us, which is the idea that we're going with, that we are trying to become love, that we're being transformed from the inside out to go and to do these things. Now I want you to turn over to Luke chapter eight. We're gonna pick up in verse 43 with our next story of what Jesus does. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, right before this interaction, there was a man named Jairus who had come to Jesus and he had asked for the healing of his child. And so that's what Jesus was doing. He was on his way to heal this man's daughter. And he has crowds of people surrounding him. He's walking with this big mob of people who are just waiting to see the next miracle of Jesus. 
They want to see what he's going to do next. They want to see him heal people. They want to be a part of that healing. So they're pressing in all around him. And in the midst of this, Jesus feels power go out of him. And I want you to think about this for just a second. How easy would it have been for Jesus to just keep walking? No one else would have known, but this woman would have been healed. Her life would have been completely changed. No one would have ever known, which is, again, going back to what Jesus does with a lot of his healings. He doesn't want anybody to know. He doesn't tell him. He's not doing it to celebrate himself. But instead, he stops. Now, there's a couple things that are important here, because when he stops and he asks, who touched me? He knows that there's one person in this crowd, many of whom have touched him, who knows exactly what he's talking about. But she's terrified. So when it says that she comes trembling, the reason she comes trembling is twofold. One, because of this discharge that she's had, she is unclean. She's not supposed to be around people. And secondly, she's a woman touching a man who's not her husband, which is a cultural no-no in this place. So she is scared of the implications of what happens when she confesses to touching this person. And so she comes trembling. She comes terrified. She's not sure what's going to happen when she confesses to this. So she tells the whole story. I've been bleeding for 12 years. I spent all my money on physicians. And I knew that if I just touched the fringe of your garment, I would be healed. And as soon as I did it, I was healed. Now what she sees in this reaction to Jesus is pure compassion. And we learn two more things about becoming love here. Those who are becoming love don't see people as interruptions. Jesus wasn't upset with her for doing this. He wasn't upset for this progress that had been stopped on his way to do another miracle. He saw this person who was hurting, who was desperate, whose faith caused her to do a couple things that were culturally not okay because she was out of options and she was scared. And he spoke this loving affirmation to her. And that's the second thing that we see is that those who are becoming love speak loving affirmations over people. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, you can see the things that he says to people. And one of the things that he consistently commends in people is their faith. That her faith has made her well. He doesn't take credit for the healing. He doesn't say, I have made you well. He says, your faith in God and the power of God to heal you is what made you well. And it was a message to everybody else that was there with them that faith is the healing agent here, not me. Now let's revisit these verses from our text here this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 to 21. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John tells us that we cannot love God without loving our brother. It's impossible for us to claim to love someone whom we've never seen, who we've never personally interacted with, if we can't first show that type of love to the people we can see, to the type of people that Jesus does love, that he shows compassion to, that he gives us this example that we should be consistently loving people. One of the problems that we face as Jesus followers is that we're more concerned with becoming the best version of ourselves rather than becoming more like Jesus. I'm going to say that again so that you can hear this because this is a cultural message that is being crammed down your throat. We are more concerned with being the best version of ourselves than we are with looking more like Jesus. Let us be a people who is more concerned, who is more consumed with looking like and being like and acting like and speaking like Jesus than we are with how we are perceived by other people. I want to finish today with the way Bob finishes this book on Everybody Always because I think it's a good encouragement for us. He struggles with the same question that we all struggle with. He's wrestling with this idea of, God, who do you want me to love? How much do I consistently pour out to these people, especially those who don't reciprocate it or who don't appreciate it? And he comes down to this at the very end of his book. He says this, Every time I wonder who I should love and for how long I should love them, God continues to whisper to me, everybody, always. Let's pray. God, you have given us so many reminders in your word about who we are to love. 
and for how long? And I'm thankful for Bob's summation of that. God, we don't get to pick and choose who we love. We get to love everybody that is placed in front of us. Those we agree with, those we don't agree with. Those who are hurting, those whose lives are going well. God, that when we see people, I pray, pray, pray that you change our lens. That we don't view them as a political party, as a race, as a gender, as anything other than people who are created in your image. Children of yours who are to be loved. And these are people that we are hoping and praying that we get to share the kingdom with. And the fewer awkward interactions we have there, the better. I don't ever want to be in this interaction in heaven where someone looks at me like, ah, I can't believe you got in after the way that I treated them. God, help me to radiate your love to people, to see them as you see them, to love them as you love them, to speak with kindness and care and compassion with the people that you put in front of me. Because God, as I talked about last week, that's the type of love that transforms the world. These are the ways that people are going to see you by our love for one another. It's the message that you gave us. When we become love, when love is perfected in us, as you say in this text this morning, God, people will see that. So give us hearts of compassion. Give us hearts of love. Help us to see the way you see, God. And to go and to live this. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of communion right now. And uh, the ushers are going to be up here when uh, you're ready to take that. But uh, one of the things that I was thinking about from 1 Corinthians this week is Paul talks about not taking this in an unworthy manner. And uh, there's a story in Matthew about how Jesus says, if you have a gift that you're about to bring and you remember that your brother has something against you, he says, leave your gift and go reconcile to your brother. And this idea that, that I've just been wrestling through of do we reconcile with one another well? Or do we just forget it? Do we just bury it and move on about our days and we go and we take communion flippantly because this is something we do in church? Or do we actually take that commendation to think this through, to pray this through, to reconcile with people? And so I'm gonna ask a little bit different this morning that you spend some time praying first before coming up here. Talk about this idea of becoming love. And there's times where all of us can look at our own lives and we can point to examples where we didn't do this well. In the last few weeks, I've struggled with anger with my kids of just not speaking lovingly and kindly to my kids in moments when I'm frustrated. And I'm having to find myself going back to them and apologizing to them for that. But I'm not doing that as readily with other people. So when I say something flippantly or when I'm not less than loving uh, in the things that I say or in the way that I act towards them, that I'm not repenting of those things. And so I want you to take some time and pray and ask God to search those things out in you. See if there's things that come to mind of people that you may need to circle back with, some things that you may need to apologize for. And then think forward about who are some people that you need to proactively love. This is kind of the challenge that I put out to you last week. Who is a person that you need to step out and show this type of love to? And I'm going to put the challenge out again this week because this is something that we should be doing every day and every week is thinking about, God, there are people that are different than me, that challenge me in ways that I don't particularly care for. But I need to love them. I need to show your love and your care and your compassion to those people. So take some time right now to pray. The ushers will come up here and they'll be here when you're ready to receive those and then we're gonna finish with another song.